while Dominic is setting up, maybe I just announce the talk. So the second speaker in this session is uh, uh, Dominic Williamson, and uh, he'll talk about anions and matrix product operator algebras. OK, great. Seems like it's on now. Um, yeah, so I'm from the Vistrata Group in Vienna, and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the people at Microsoft for organizing this conference. It's been great so far. Um, and I want to talk to you about some recent work we did um, connecting tensor networks, basically, to anions in a very kind of concrete way. So the overview of the result is that we kind of start from some matrix product operators that are sort of inspired by symmetries that we've early, earlier found in tensor networks that have topological order. Um, and then just sort of trying to use basic theory of tensor network states to get from this all the way to like the physical anions and actually constructing them very concretely in wave functions. So the goal, like the hope is then in future we can use this kind of representation to really like explore um, more quantum information-y aspects of like anion braided anion computing and other things like that. Great. Um, oh yeah, and I'll give you a small overview of the talk. So I'm going to start by um, giving some background, although after the last talk, maybe I can go quicker, because uh, we had a nice explanation of sort of anion um, models. And hopefully, everyone went to Norbert's nice lectures on the weekend. Um, I'll give a little brief overview of tensor networks as well, if you didn't, but uh, that should be good. And then I'll get into the results, so cool. Let's start. Yeah. OK, so here's just a nice little mug shots of all my collaborators. Um, on this project, the lion's share of the work, I think, was done by Nick Boltink and Mikhail Marion, who are at Ghent, um, also in Frank's group. Uh, we also have the Borak working on this, um, and our supervisors, Yutho Hageman and Frank Verstrada. So yeah, all these guys need to optimize their SEO <laughs> search, because this is what you find if you Google their names. It's not great. <laughs> OK, so I, uh, I think although 2016 was bad for a lot of reasons, it was very good for topological physics. There was recognition of some really great early work um, in the topological phases of matter by Kostelitz, Thales, and Haldane. And I think the really great thing about this for me is that you can really like, trace the path from their research to what's going on now. Like, and it's sort of exploded. So all the stuff we studied with topological order um, in 2D systems with anion models and this sort of thing, and like SPT and 1D, you can kind of trace back to work these guys did. Um, yeah, and perhaps one of the most interesting things that I'm sure they, didn't, they never expected when they were doing their work was the connection that was found between these kind of topologically ordered systems and sort of quantum memories due to Kataev. So I guess I'll just briefly say the idea um, kind of that because you have this topological degree of freedom that um, can't be accessed locally by any sort of measurement, then if you sort of just think about this, you can just rephrase this sort of condition of topological stability as just it being a code. Um, and I probably won't go any more detail into that. But yeah, um, so I think, oh, and the last thing that really was great in the past year um, has been the experimental progress. So the other group of Microsoft in Santa Barbara, led by uh, Friedman, one of the other people who worked early on topological order for quantum computation, um, has been sort of racing towards making these Majorana qubits, another idea sort of originally at least popularized by Kataev. Um, and I think I saw somewhere in a, an interview with Calvin Hoven, one of the leading experimentalists, that he's predicting 2017 to be the year of observing braiding, which would be amazing. I mean, if not for topological quantum computation, just for topological physics. So I think it's a really exciting time to be working on this field. Um, cool. So I guess the fundamental question of all this that is also just fundamentally should be interesting to people in quantum information is just a classification of states problem. So you can phrase it as a Hamiltonian problem or states, but here I'll just stick to the state formulation. So the question is really what states of matter can they possibly be? Um, I think this, this line is ripped directly from the Nobel Prize announcement for like future work on this field. Um, and you can sort of phrase it in this way where you just think about some family of states. So I've kind of been a bit sloppy on the board there. But you have some family of states on, on lattices, and you've got to pick the lattice as sort of messy details. But you want to sort of identify some universal properties of these states and group them into equivalence classes where you don't care about sort of local details. And the way we wash out the local details is by taking equivalence up to some constant depth local unitary. 
Um, so families of states equivalent up to constant depth local unitary. And then one of the fundamental questions, or probably the fundamental questions in topological phases of matter is what are the phases and how can we sort of come up with invariants such that if you give me some state or Hamiltonian, I can sort of calculate something and tell you which phase it's in. Cool. So the answer in 1D is kind of simple, for bosonic systems at least. There's sort of no topological order by this definition. Um, of course, there's a lot of interesting things happening there in terms of SPT, but we won't talk more about that. In 2D, I think there isn't really a rigorous to the level of this community um, classification, although the answer is known to condensed matter theorists to their level of rigor. And the answer is in terms of these anions or super selection sectors. So this is kind of answering both questions at once. Um, you sort of look at consistent particle theories of topological excitations in these models, and these provide you some kind of invariance of the phases and also tell you by looking at what possible of these models there can be, it tells you what possible phases there can be. Um, yeah, so I guess the core idea of this is looking at super selection sectors. So here I'm denoting rho, sort of the uh, reduced density matrix kind of in this little circle region there. And if we want to sort of look at the um, again, we want to kind of wash out local details. So we want to look at an equivalence class of kind of what reduced density matrices we can have here after we put in some excitations on top of the ground state up to local things we can do. And here, the, the only um, restriction is that it has to be unitary within that region. So you, you can imagine the toric code, you could have like one E excitation and you kind of enclose this in a big region. Then this will be a distinct super selection sector from the vacuum because even though we can create other pairs of E particles and M particles or whatever you like, there's always going to be an excess of one E particle when we sort of do the overall counting. Um, and by taking this equivalence class here of these local reduced density matrices up to unitaries within a region, we can kind of find a discrete set of super selection sectors. And this is sort of the starting point for building the anion theory. Um, and just, yeah, one kind of key property of these things is that they really have some kind of they really change the correlation structure between the inside and the outside of this region. So if I have a different sort of super selection sector within this region, um, and then I kind of cut it out, so everywhere around that, the, the sort of state will still just be looking like the ground state locally. But in fact, these two states, although they look the same, are very different. And um, you can kind of see this by analyzing entanglement properties. OK, so we abstract this um, kind of theory of super selection sectors into some diagrammatic calculus. as also probably popularized by Kataev, but goes back a bit further in terms of uh, more heavily categorical notions. Um, and the most basic thing you can do with these super selection sectors is just bring them together to form a bigger super selection sector, which is described by this kind of fusion process. Um, and this will give you like some kind of algebra structure of the fusion. Um, and then I think the thing that actually make th makes these super selection sectors so interesting for quantum computation or interesting at all is because the fusion process is not actually associative. It's only associative up to some kind of factor. And you have this which way degree of freedom that's sort of a topological um, um, encoded Hilbert space when you fuse three of these things. Um, and in, inside this little piece of which way information, you can encode, inf you can encode some data and also when you look at the associativity, you actually find there's some matrix acting on that degree of freedom. The other thing you can do with these um, super selection sectors in sort of space time is start to braid them around each other. And because like the path of one around the other in 2D is sort of homotopically non-trivial, so you can't contract it, you actually don't have to find just boson or fermion statistics. You can find sort of more crazy statistics and even sort of unitaries that act within some um, larger Hilbert space. And that's just sort of symbolized by this sort of crossing tensor, which usually you write in some fusion basis. Um, so overall, these things can't be anything. They have to sort of fit together in a nice way. And this sort of pentagon equation is just the consistency for the F symbol. And the key point I want you to get here is that the um, F symbol data and the fusion structure is kind of, dis it's sort of decoupled from this, um, or it's sort of independent of this braiding structure. So you can sort of solve this one first, and then once you find these solutions, you can look for different braided solutions on top of that. And these are really, this is sort of one level structure more than the, the Pentagon equation. Oh, and just finally, so when you solve these equations, you only get a solution up to some gauge relations. Um, so one thing people like to do is look at gauge um, invariant qu in, um, quantities. So the most popular ones are this S matrix and this T matrix. So this is like the topological spin of a particle, if you kind of give it a twist. Okay, so now on to tensor network background. So yeah, I guess the idea of tensor networks, you can tell it's quite a good idea because it's come up quite a few times in different places. Um, 
before like exploding, I guess, in the work of the group um, at, of, of Serac in the early 2000s. But I guess earlier it came up in, term, um, in this paper of Fannis, Snack, Degala, Verna as pure finitely correlated states where they were trying to take sort of continuum limits in a rigorous way. And also it came up numerically in the work of uh, Steve White um, when he sort of created DMRG, although he didn't look at it that way. It was later rephrased as a tensor network algorithm. Um, and I guess the big success of tensor networks is all in one dimension where like both theoretically and numerically it works really well. So like numerically it works so well that it even works for systems it shouldn't work for, like where the gap is closing. But for gaps, yeah, spin chains, you kind of, it's just the go-to algorithm. And um, in terms of theory, there's been a lot of work by uh, Perez Garcia, Shook, uh, Fistrada, and um, Serac, as well as Wolf, um, I think, sort of class of, uh, sort of characterizing beyond the Fannis and Actigal Laverna paper, the structure of 1D matrix product states, or 1D tensor network states, which are called matrix product states. Okay. So let's get to some more details. Usually we use this kind of notation, which I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk. So hopefully you saw this in Norbert's talk. But we indicate these tensors, which are just sort of arrays of complex numbers um, via these little boxes. So if you stick in a label on each edge to fix, to fix it, you'll find just a complex number there. Um, we also use this kind of summation convention, where if two lines are joined, you sort of have a dummy index, which is summed over in that tensor. OK. So now you can use this to create a state. So in 1D, you have these matrix product states, which you just get by basically decomposing the coefficient in some basis where you've chosen a local basis on each site into a product of matrices. So the reason this works really well is because computers are good at, compu at computing products of matrices. Um, and this is what it looks like in the diagrammatic formalism. Um, OK, and now onto a bit of structure of these things. So, if you think about what these matrices are doing, let's maybe go back to this one. As you hop along, you're getting acted on by some guy from this um, set of matrices, depending on the index down here, the physical spin. Um, and as you move along the chain, you can think of maybe I stay within some invariant subspace of this set of matrices. So you can then just sort of rewrite, just so think of writing this these set of matrices in this basis of the invariant subspaces. So if I have like some smallest invariant subspace, I can kind of uh, pull out that block and it'll be an irreducible algebra. And then I might have another invariant subspace that's sort of bigger than that one, and that will be another block. And then there might be some hopping between them. And I can sort of continue this to get like an upper triangular block form for this set of matrices. And then you realize because you're sort of tracing them at the end, you have this trace here. If you ever hopped when you were going along the chain, that contribution will die. So actually, what you can do is just to get an equivalent matrix product state, you just throw away all these off diagonal blocks. So that's, you just put zeros up here and you'll find the same state, which is just given by this one, um, the sum of these sort of irreducible states. So those are sort of the important uh, building blocks for tensor network um, states in 1D. And now the second really important sort of result, which I guess is now being called the fundamental theorem of matrix product states, is that given a few like nice conditions, um, if you have these kind of two, two such matrix product states that are equal for all lengths, then um, there actually exists some local gauge relation that relates the tensors, which is, I think, still surprising to me, but it's um, quite cool. So you can see the converse is kind of obviously true. If I stick um, this uh, conjugated A tensor everywhere into a matrix product state, all the XX inverses will just cancel, and I'll be left with the same matrix product state as if I just stuck in the A itself. But this theorem is really proving the converse, that if I have two seemingly unrelated tensors that just happen to give the same MPS for all sizes, there's some local gauge relation. So it's like a global to local thing that we will end up using later. Oh, and the last thing I thought I should mention is just this sort of small generalization of matrix product states to matrix product operators. Um, so it's just the same idea, except now you're just decomposing the coefficients of an operator into a uh, matrix product structure. And of course, if you kind of group the bra and ket labels back into a ket label, you're back to the theory of matrix product states. So all the results there just carry over directly. Um, yeah, and so going up a dimension, things become more difficult, both theoretically and numerically. Um, but there, there is a natural generalization, at least one, of matrix product states to higher dimensions. It's called projected entangled pair states. Um, and say on the square lattice in 2D, these will be given by a fundamental building block that's like a five index tensor which we then contract up on, say, a torus, if this has periodic boundary conditions, to find some state. Um, and the idea is sort of similar to matrix product states, although more difficult. Uh, and these are the kind of states we're going to be looking at moving forward. 
So the question you can ask is like, what are the fundamental building blocks of these states? Another way of asking that is like, is there a left inverse? Can I access the full virtual entanglement space by just acting on this one physical space? So I should say the notation here, I'm thinking of this A as a map from these virtual indices to this physical index, and this uh, pseudo inverse as being um, acting from this physical index to these virtual indices. So if you kind of trace this one through, that's this guy here. So you can ask this question, can you access the full virtual space? And this is a condition called injectivity. And some work had previously been done sort of showing that um, injectivity excludes topological order, basically. So if we want to look at topological systems, this is a really bad condition. Um, so yes, kill that. Then in previous work of um, Sirac, Shuk, and uh, Perez Garcia, there was a generalization of this injectivity condition to some kind of group algebra. And this allowed them to describe some topological phases. It was then generalized by Bush paper and later by Frank's group with the same collaborators as this paper um, to just a matrix product operator. So we know this can't just be injective, so it has to live on some subspace. We want to characterize that subspace. And we used a matrix product operator to do that, which was general enough to sort of describe all non-chiral topological order in 2 plus 1D. Um, so we need a few more conditions than just this matrix product operator being the local sort of restriction on the entanglement structure. We also, if we wanted to describe some kind of topological property, we, we wanted this pulling through condition such that this thing behaves a bit like a Wilson loop. If you put it into your state, it can kind of freely move so it's not locally detectable. And with a few more technical conditions, this was um, our set of axioms for this kind of class of matrix product states. So this is where the idea to study these matrix product operators came from. They were kind of a relevant symmetry in um, these topological models that are known as string net models. OK, so now on to the results. Um, so the idea in this section is that we just want to start, we're going to kind of forget about the 2D stuff a bit for, for now and just think about this matrix product operator. We're going to look at its structure and then try to see what arises from that and identify some sort of uh, structure we can see as an anion theory by just using sort of ideas from matrix, uh, from matrix product states. So the first thing to, to note is because we're always considering these sort of projectors to be sort of periodic boundary conditions, we can use this normal form. This breaks up this projector into some sum of blocks. Um, and these like blocks are kind of the building, the building blocks of this big thing. So if you now think about what the fact that this is a projector means, it means for these individual blocks that they form an algebra. So because you have this um, sort of global to local reduction thing, you know that the blocks um, on the left and the right side of this have to match. And so if you do a bit of reshuffling, you see that the product of any two blocks on this side can be identified with some linear combination of blocks on the right-hand side. Um, and since this is true for all sizes, there's this local reduction tensor, which will become important later, that actually reduces this product to um, the single guy in its uh, possible outcomes. Um, now, I want to, yeah, so this is all just from the theory of MPS, but to actually get anywhere, we needed to make one more sort of assumption that was true for all the models we knew, um, and still not sure how restrictive this is, but we basically need that there exists a form of this um, MPS, or matrix product operator, such that this condition holds, which is just a stronger version of the last condition. And it's kind of saying that we throw away some subspace here that sort of doesn't matter once we reduce down to here, and it just was never there in the first place. So there, there are ways this could fail, but it's true for all the interesting matrix product operators we know. Um, and one way to see why this is important is by thinking about this sort of fixed point PEPs. So if you have this PEPs with this entanglement structure locally, you can make a fixed point version by just taking the local tensor to be this little loop of NPO. And then your fixed point state is just a whole bunch of these um, little pieces of um, matrix product operator tied together. And if we want this state itself to have this sort of topological symmetry, we need some condition like this. Um, and in fact, the zipper condition that I showed you in the previous slide ensures this is true. So it tells us that this state we build out of this thing, which is meant to describe topological order, is indeed topological itself. It's kind of good. Um, and once we have this condition, we, can, we actually find that we recover an F symbol. So this X guy behaves like a fusion vertex that I showed you in the sort of algebraic description of anions. Um, and now if you look at fusing a product of three um, MPOs in two different ways, so first you can fuse A and B and then with C, or first B and C and then with A, you actually find that there's some vector space there because this X 
there actually may be multiple X's doing the same fusion. This um, result in the middle, if you kind of do the reduction all at once, it's um, a degree of freedom and so, as well. And so this uh, matrix can actually act on that degree of freedom as well as these two degeneracy indices. Um, to see how you actually derive this, I have a little messy slide, but hopefully you can follow the general idea. You look at this reduction of three um, tensors to one and the other reduction of the same product of three tensors to one. You then bring in the inverse to this right-hand side, which uh, gets rid of it there, but gives you this kind of commutator on this um, in the right-hand side of the equation. You then use this sort of injectivity property of these irreducible matrix product operators to get rid of the MPO itself. And then upon taking the trace of this little line here and this bit here, you'll find this actually gives you the F symbol. So it kind of comes out directly. You can then look at products of four of these guys to get back the Pentagon equation. I didn't show it again because conceptually it's basically the same as in the fusion category language. Um, and so the result is really here, just starting from these matrix product operators that build up the full projector. These are like the objects of some tensor category. You have these morphisms, which are just basically matrices acting on the sort of virtual indices of these things. And we have a notion of tensor products in the fusion category sense, which is not like just a sort of normal Hilbert space tensor product, but a more complicated tensor product that's given by just taking local um, products of these matrix product operators with uh, open boundaries. So of course, if you kind of close this boundary, you're back to actually just having an algebra. So of course, it has to be associative. And the algebra you get by taking these periodic boundary conditions is just this sort of thing called the fusion ring or the fusion algebra of this fusion category. It's sort of a common concept. Um, yeah, so this is like the first step. There's still no braiding here though. So this is not actually identifying the anions of the theory yet. Um, so how do we actually construct an anion or identify an anion in the PEPs? That's sort of the next step. Um, and you could make a guess that maybe this anion is just sort of, by, you get this by putting in some linear combination of the blocks of this algebra into your, your PEP state. Um, this turns out to have totally the wrong properties to describe super selection sectors though. For one thing, these things are not sort of locally orthogonal. It also doesn't give you the right number of anions in sort of known models. Um, so one way to sort of think about the resolution to this, which was initially just, I think, a guess of Nick, but it turned out to be connected to a lot of stuff people have done previously um, in the theory of sort of 2D topological order and category theory and sort of planar algebras, um, is to put in this extra loop. And you can kind of think of what this extra loop is doing is, although this anion theory is not braided, just sort of imagine it was braided and we have some kind of anion sitting there. We want to project this into a definite charge sector. There might be some superposition there, but by braiding around, we can measure which exact anion is there. And um, by putting in the correct sort of um, superposition of encircling anions, we can really project onto a charge sector. So that's kind of the inspiration for this guess. So here, this is all just the same matrix product operator. But here we have this tensor, and this really contains all the topological information. So it's just a four index tensor living on the virtual spaces of this MPO. Um, and once you've defined this, you now have a secondary algebra. So you can, the first thing you can do is you can expand this tensor out in some basis, which I don't know by these blue guys, because it's kind of too hard to draw this every time. But these blue guys are just given by some six index object where two of them are degeneracy indices. The other three indices are those of the um, matrix product operator, virtual indices. And it's, you can just decompose it into two of these fusion tensors. So yeah, maybe just remember that the first three letters in this um, description of it are the A, B, and C indices that kind of go through the tensor. And this last index, D, is the one that goes around. And then the degeneracy indices are not too important for understanding um, the general structure. So when you start to like look at the properties of this, um, these MPOs, first of all, they form an algebra, which is not in immediately obvious, but because this sort of MPO is itself um, a projector, you can kind of reduce everything to just some contraction of these two tensors. And then they actually go back to um, some expansion in the original basis. So I'm just denoting different objects in the algebra by different colors. And when you take a product of two, you end up back in the algebra. So it's closed. So this is good. You can take linear combinations. And also, it turns out to be a star algebra. So if you take some complex conjugation of this thing, um, acting from the outside to the inside, and then there are some more tricky properties I didn't mention, which have to do with orientations, which actually end up being important, but I don't have time to cover them. Um, and you use these kind of properties of bending lines from one orientation to the other. You find that it's actually closed under this emission conjugation operation, too. So it's a C star algebra. Um, and now the thing to do with C star algebra is to see what its block decomposition is. 
So it has some kind of block decomposition. Um, and we want to start looking for the projectors onto different blocks. These projectors will give you like a good set of quantum numbers for this, um, for kind of measurements onto discrete and definite charge sectors. And so th this was actually mostly due to Mikhail, and he used a constructive version, which he programmed up of the artin weddenburn theorem um, to basically just find these central idempotents. Um, so yeah, so the idea is here's the conditions just written in terms of the matrix product operators, and I've denoted these solutions as having a white dot in them. So the little blobs of the white dot are these special elements of the algebra that are actually central idempotents. Um, you also need to make sure they're irreducible, otherwise you'll have a superposition of anions. And this is, I think, where the hard work is. But once you do this, you have this um, complete set of, of idempotents that sort of decompose the identity in your algebra. Um, and these give you your set of quantum numbers for the charge states. Okay. And once you have that, so this is just this block decomposition in terms of these central idempotents tells you the anions, but now we want to extract some topological information from them. Um, the first thing that's easiest to extract is the um, topological spin. So if you look at what doing a two pi rotation actually means for this little idempotent, you can reduce it to just some little loop around this tensor. And if you actually just, you can sort of do this by hand, just compute what happens here it ends up actually giving you the topological spin um, times the original guy. You can also do fusion with these things. And this is somewhat reminiscent of this pair of pants decomposition. If you kind of think of each of these as being some boundary hole and this as between them being some surface, this is like some morphism space from this outside ring to these two inside rings. Um, so we, we, we've constructed a second algebra and it's turned out that this also has a fusion structure. Um, that's not just the same as the multiplication structure. Of the, of the operators. Um, and here, the, this tensor is just the X tensor. It also has a braiding structure. So if you look at, you just want to sort of solve this equation for an unknown here. And it turns out that the solution is actually the same as just this idempotent, which is actually a well-known thing in um, the condensed matter literature. Um, so this, knowing this equation tells you how to do braiding as well. So now we've recovered this full structure of the anion theory. We have fusion and the braiding. Um, and in principle, we can actually look at complicated processes of braiding the, and fusing these anions within a tensor network. Um, so here, I've just, I've tried, I wanted to draw like a, a cool circuit going on in terms of a topological quantum computation, but I got a bit lazy because it took a long time to draw. So I've just drawn like one braid. But in principle, what we want to start doing is looking at putting these um, excitations into a 2D tensor network state for the ground state of the model um, that hosts these excitations, and then starting to braid them. So here, I just brought these around clockwise, um, one full braid, and we'll find we'll start to find these matrices on the virtual level. Uh, and sorry, I didn't actually draw in the tensors explicitly, but each crossing of the red line with the black line should be an MPO tensor. Um, and so, if we start to do more complicated things, what we'll find is we'll we'll have this big network that's just sort of like a tensor network on the virtual level that tells you what's going on with this topological quantum computation in terms of the correlation degrees of freedom of the state. This is very reminiscent of how me me um, measurement-based quantum computation works in PEPs. In measurement-based quantum computation in PEPs, after doing the measurements, you can kind of see exactly the circuit arising on the virtual level. And here, after doing a bunch of braiding, we don't have to pick a, a definite fusion basis. We can just immediately see some kind of almost quantum circuit, which you can lift to a quantum circuit. It's sort of a unitary on a subspace. Um, and hopefully, we can understand some more structure or some kind of improvements on topological quantum computation using this um, approach from the correlation degrees of freedom. Okay, so to summarize this uh, results of this matrix product operator approach, we first looked at these individual blocks coming from the symmetry of a tensor network state that has topological order. Um, and we found that they actually form a fusion category, which I called C. We then found this auxiliary operator that you need to decompose um, sort of excitations into definite charge sectors. Um, and we found that these were the physical anions of the theory. And actually, mathematically, this thing is called the double of this category. So there's some process in category theory um, that is called taking the double of the Drinfeld center. And it turns out that doing this whole um, um, calculation in terms of tensor networks was just really doing this on the category theory side. And that, of course, agrees with the known answer of what the excitation should be in a model um, that has this kind of symmetry. So if you take a string net model with this as the sort of input category, like these are your string labels, then um, 
it's known that the, out, the um, output anions are this double. And if you take our matrix product operator for the symmetry of that state, then the output algebra is this um, double of the input. OK, so here's some examples. First, the toric code, which everyone knows and loves. So it's, I have to admit, this is kind of overkill to do the toric code. This was previously contained in the formalism of G injectivity. But it's a nice example to get a feel for what's happening. So here, the matrix product operators are actually just tensor products. So if I have uh, this matrix product operator projector, um, there's just a, an, an index running around the virtual level that's coordinating whether to be in the identity or the x locally. So I'll have like a, a sum of the identity with the, the x if I have the full projector. Um, and now these values of the crossing tensor give you the different particles. And maybe we can go through them so, like, just to get a feel for it. So if I have zero going in both directions, that means that I have nothing coming out of this particle, no line. It's just a line of identities. And around here, it's just identity. If I have a, a one going this way, it means there's a ring of x's around there. So this is just projecting onto the support of this matrix product operator, which we knew was our vacuum state, because that's the sort of that's a symmetry of the, the peps locally without any excitations. This E excitation is now projecting orthogonal to that. The M excitation has a line of x's coming out, but is projecting um, onto the identity plus x in this sector. So that you can think of that as a flux, because there's kind of like a line of x's coming out. And then the EM particle has this projector onto the 1 minus x state, while also having a line of flux. And if you calculate the topological spins, you, you see what you expect. Um, these are all bosons, and this one's a fermion. So this is spin half. OK, now a more um, involved example. So you can do this for um, all of the string nets. And for the Fibonacci theory, um, DMPO kind of looks like this. So the basics of this theory is that it has fusion rule, single non-trivial particle, and the fusion rule is that it can go back to itself or the vacuum. Um, it has a set of F symbols, which I didn't bother to write down because I don't think you'll get anything out of that. But the way that the MPO works is it's basically just given by an F symbol. So this is from our previous work, um, and it's kind of a bit tricky, but you basically get that each of these indices going through the tensor are just copied twice. And so you get two copies of each um, degree of freedom to different legs, and then the overall um, weight of this MPO is given by the F symbol. The fusion tensors are also, give, also given by F symbols in a similar way. Um, the algebra is spanned by this, these elements, so I think it's uh, seven-dimensional. And yeah, just remember the first three entries of this are the lines going through into the, the um, anion, and then the last entry is the loop going around the anion. So here we can see the vacuum particle is, again, just a projector onto um, 1 plus tau going around the anion, which is the vacuum sector or the MPO of the um, vacuum. And then these other particles, we get a complex conjugate pair with um, conjugate spins that we identify as tau and tau bar. And then we get their product tau tau bar, um, which actually has, is a two-dimensional block in the algebra. Um, this, this sort of approach also works for non-modular theories. So there's an example with S3 in the paper, which I didn't put on a slide because it just has too much information. So we have like the double of S3. And in principle, it can work given any sort of input category. This is just a process you have to run and you'll find these outputs, which are the anions. Although identifying them can become a bit trickier when there's a lot of them. Um, OK. So the things we want to do in future with this, some of which we've already started, is including fermions, which you might think is a small trivial, like sort of it won't change the general structure that much, but it turns out to actually make things a lot more interesting. Um, we also want to look at symmetry in enriched topological order, which is connected to how transversal gates act on topological codes. Um, more on actually how this virtual level representation might help us think about topological quantum computation. Um, and looking at things like domain walls between different topological orders. And then, of course, going to higher dimensions, which uh, may be too tricky. OK, so thanks. Yeah, the overall picture is that we have some symmetry of a tensor network state. And from this, we can extract the anion theory, which tells us everything about the topological order in that state. And thanks for your attention. Questions? Uh, how the parent Hamiltonian of this model looks like? How the Hamiltonian? So given a tensor network state, you automatically have a Hamiltonian. And a, a lot of the time, I was just talking about the matrix product operator. But there's this kind of chain of inclusions, I guess. So from this matrix product operator, we could construct a PEPS, which was this tensor I showed, where you have the PEPS tensor just being a small loop of the matrix product operator that PEPS will have a parent Hamiltonian. So if you like, 
you can think of that parent Hamiltonian and how that works is it just looks at a small patch of the peps, so like four sites in, of the peps on a square lattice, and it just projects onto the support subspace of the, temp, of the uh, map from the virtual degrees of freedom to the physical degrees of freedom. So that, that's kind of the parent Hamiltonian you associate to an MPO. Yep. Thank you. I guess so, but uh, are these uh, excitations, uh, can you prove that they are exact eigenstates of the parent Hamiltonian? Um, so it's a bit tricky because we actually, if you notice, we change the Hilbert space slightly when we think about this. And this kind of doesn't matter when you're thinking about super selection sectors because you can do isometries. But if you really want to make, if you use those in ansatz, what you want to do is put in, I kind of skipped this detail, but maybe I should show uh, just explicitly. You want to put in some different tensor here that is joined to this index. So this, this kind of uh, MPO here just identifies the subspace on which the excitation lives. It, there can also be some local degrees of freedom involved with the anion and other, other things that are just not important topologically. But if you wanted to use it in practice, you would want to introduce a, a six index tensor here that's different to the other tensors that reflects the properties of the anion. And as long as it's on the support subspace of this guy, it will be some description of that anion. I don't know if that answers the question. But. And, and that thing should be, it should be possible for that to be an exact uh, eigenstate, yeah. Yes, there. Uh, can you get any modular tensor category in that way? So say if I give you fusion rules, can you find tensors that make that work? Or? Yeah, so the way this works is that only the output anions are only um, non-chiral anions because they always go through this double construction. The only results we find always factor through this double construction. And this, if the input theory was modular, is just a copy of the state and its time reverse, which tells you that it's definitely non-chiral. But even in this case where it's not modular and this double is a bit more complicated, it's still not modular. So the only things we can find are doubles. And that's kind of a, I think that's more fundamental than the approach we took. If we generalize our approach slightly, it would still be doubles. But of course, looking for chiral things is another ongoing project. I know like Norbert Schuch and Ignacio Serac have worked a lot on this and are making progress, which is very interesting. But it seems to be that you have to start from a slightly different place to get there, although MPO symmetries are important. So if there's no further questions at this point, then let's conclude the session. And let's thank Dominic and both speakers of this session.